Okay, our, our speaker tonight is Alan Rockefeller. And I had a chance to talk with Alan uh, over dinner earlier. It's the first time we've had a chance to, to really talk. Um, Alan immigrated to California after 21 years in the uh, Chicago area and uh, got here and has had a apparently very successful career in uh, software engineering and security because it allows him to take as much time as he apparently wants <laughs> to uh, do uh, mycology in Mexico and throughout uh, Northern California and the Bay Area. If you are a uh, partisan on any of the uh, lists for MSSF, the Fungus Federation, BAMS, Alan is a frequent contributor and a remarkably knowledgeable uh, source of information about what's coming up here. Uh, if you go to his website, you'll see some remarkable images that you'll, uh, I'm sure, see tonight. So, and let me also mention that Alan's parents are here uh, from Illinois, and we'll get to hear him present this evening. So, Uh, without further ado, uh, Alan, let's turn it over to you. Um, so I got about 200 slides here, and um, if you have any questions, I will take questions at the end, but please just go ahead and interrupt me and shout your question out, it's always best to get the questions answered when you think about them. This talk is dedicated to my parents. Oh, oh. And do cat too. Um, so this is the guy that I visited in Mexico. I started growing in Mexico in about 2007. Um, and I just sent this guy a message on the internet. Um, and he started asking if I come down to Mexico and look for mushrooms with him. And he said, sure. And so met this guy at the Guadalajara airport. And um, he ended up being really cool. He's a biologist. Um, in this picture, he is giving a talk on shiitake cultivation at a fungus fair in Michoacan. And um, at the point that I took this picture, he was saying something like, and the mushrooms will be your salvation. <laughs> <laughs> so I always start out in Jalisco. Um, Jalisco is over on the Pacific coast, uh, kind of in southern Mexico. All of the mushrooms in Mexico are kind of in the southern part. The southern part of Mexico is the good part. Uh, we never really have any trouble with people down there. Um, the climate is sort of similar to California. There's a lot of rolling hills. Um, this is what it looks like. This is Sierra de Gila. Um, so where we took this picture was kind of warm. There was all sorts of cow fields and stuff around there. And then um, up on the top of this uh, mountain is a really good place to take edibles. Um, they have all sorts of amanitas and bull leaves. And um, what town are you near? Uh, that was near near the town of Kila. Uh, it was about an hour from Guadalajara. Uh, they also have really cool flowers in Mexico. Uh, this is the Lofa Pizarro. Uh, really crazy looking beetle we found. And this is a morel. Um, the morels in Mexico were way different than the morels in California. Uh, in Mexico, they grow in very high elevation mountain ravines. And so I brought this morel back and took it over to UC Berkeley and sequenced the DNA. And it um, turns out that uh, we checked four, uh, four loci, four areas of the DNA, and it's a 100% match with a morel that I found in South San Francisco on the Genentech campus. So this is Morcella rufo -Bernan. Uh, probably the only species of morels that grow in Mexico. Uh, also, the morel season in Mexico is very late. It's like September, October, November, December. Um, a kind of year when the morels are not coming up anywhere else in the world. The um, Mexican government puts up these very helpful signs let us know where the landslides are. Um, this is a Pupilio Garamas on uh, Salonsubi's Um This uh, this landslide is covered in these things. Uh, so this is a tiger swallowtail caterpillar. Very beautiful, and when we found it, it was rocking its head back and forth. It's a movie out on YouTube that's really, uh, really interesting looking. Uh, one of the local caterpillars. Uh, this picture won one of the photo contests online. Uh, 
this is another cluster of salons to be the corn on the same last slide. And more is the corn. And then this one is Salon Sabi Caber Lessons. Uh, also on the same last slide, they're a completely different, uh, different section. And Salon Sabi Fiorelli, the uh, veil is just breaking there. Now, but how old was the lead slide? Um, I'd say the best man's signs that are about two or three years old. Um, so the psilocybes are some of the first mushrooms to come and colonize these landslides when they happen. And they're instrumental in turning this kind of messed up uh, habitat back into good dirt that, uh, you know, for other trees and plants and mushrooms. This is a really rare species, um, psilocybe youngensis. We only find this in one bog, uh, if I have one landslide, that would be in one place that we know of. Extremely slow growing, but pretty cool looking. What are you using to key these? Where do you get the key? Um, the reference material I use for this is called the Genus Philosophy by Justin Guzman. Um, it's pretty good, but you definitely need a microscope to get anywhere um, with those mushrooms. Are they all psychoactive? Everything in philosophy is psychoactive because all of the non psychoactive philosophies have recently been uh, kicked out and put into the cornica. What's that? <laughs> Um, this is a lobster mushroom. These are very popular in Mexico. You can like, order them in restaurants. Um, they're also pretty common. This one looks like a deadly amanita, but it's actually edible. This one is Amanita Tuza, and it is in such an Cesarie, and it is bright white, and uh, Mexicans sell it in the markets all the time. Mm. This one is Amanita, we'll call it Amanita Yema. Um, it's, it's the ones the Mexicans call Amanita cesarea, but the cesarea is a European species, it's definitely different. So, Amanita yema is very delicious, very popular um, in Mexico, and you can order it in a lot of the restaurants in Oaxaca. They They go wrong. This one is Amanita zainita volata, um, it's a close relative to Amanita gemata. And uh, this one also won a photo contest. This one is um, I have to be Calvinist Do you train these creatures? <laughs> no, we just uh, when we find cool Please mushrooms, we um, yeah. we hold them for cool bugs, and then we put the cool bugs on the on the mushrooms. And then we them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I have to be Calvinist has this bright blue green stem yes. case, um, which leads a lot of people to think that it's like a psychedelic mushroom. But it is actually poisonous, like most members of Hynosity. Uh, it's pretty common under pine. Uh, this is one that no one's been able to identify yet. Um, maybe a Dehemon species. Um, but this picture I took using the microscope, so I took this at 40x. Um, the problem with, well, there's two problems with taking pictures like this under the microscope. For one, you have to illuminate it from above. So I just shined a little LED headlamp uh, from above and just use a regular compound microscope. The other issue is that the depth of field is extremely narrow when you take pictures through the microscope. So what I did is I took 30 pictures of this and um, just held down the, the high-speed shutter while I was turning the fine focus very slowly. And so I had 30 pictures. Each one had a very small part in focus. And then I used some free window software called Combine ZP, which combines multiple pictures that are, um, have narrow depth of field into one picture where everything's in focus. <laughs> There's a really good Marasmian's diversity wow. in Mexico. Beautiful. <laughs> this is Amanita flavoconia. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like an avocado sandwich. Um, this one took us years to identify. This is a Roto Arrhenia. Um, really cool looking thing. Very rare. Um, but in this one part of Mexico, we find it all the time, all over the hill box. Uh, probably, but it's, it's really rare, so we, we only eat the common things usually. You got your little square before there? Um, now we're all out of the ball. No, I pressed the wrong, uh, the wrong arrow. Uh, no worries, we're easy. We go. You're good, you're good. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. Uh, yeah, so in the square we have the underside of this mushroom. It's got these really interesting wrinkles. And we're not really sure which Roto Arrhenia species it is, but that's, that's good enough for now. And this is an undescribed Cudonia species. 
and uh, more lobster mushrooms. I was popular out there. And uh, we cook mushrooms just about every day for dinner. Uh, more Erasmus. It really helps to have a nice macro lens when you find that Erasmus like this. This is a Humidicutus marginata, recently kicked out of hygrosity. And this is Callistosporium luteo olivaceum. Which um, one? The girl is Deborah. Uh, what altitude are you on? Uh, that was about 2,500, 53,000 feet there. Yeah, they're very widely distributed. Um, so we have this nice microscope down there in Mexico, and I carry it around with me everywhere. And we take pictures of all the spores and cystidia. Um, we go with all of the macroscopic pictures. Um, this is a Bolatellus ananus. Uh, Bolatellus was split off of Bovidus because it has these longitudinally striated spores. Wow. And Bovidus has smooth spores. Uh, here's a Bovidus that we were never able to identify. Maybe in the black color group. Um, this bowl ate we found in 2007, and uh, we ate it, and uh, wish we hadn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> wish we hadn't have done that because we haven't seen it since. Oh. And, uh, it's very rare. Oh. Um, and it's also very delicious. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Here's some more uh, Amnita, maybe Basiae. Um, the red ones we call Amnita Takamate. Is that related to Jackson Yeah, these are all in section Cesarean, and uh, Jackson I is also in section Cesarean. So um, Cesarean is a pretty big section, and all of the members are edible. This one's a cordyceps uh, growing on a caterpillar. The cordyceps in diversity in Mexico is very good. There's a lot of really cool ones. Did you try eating any of them? Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, I don't know if they do anything or not, but they certainly don't hurt. <laughs> This is Laura. Uh, Laura found this undescribed stinkhorn species. She's really excited by it. <laughs> um, the, the closest described one has a white stem, so this definitely needs to be uh, needs to have a new name applied. This is a really cool labiota species. It looks uh, just like any other regular labiota, um, except that it's actually labiota cavalescens. So this uh, this labiota stays blue. Um, and it's different than the hallucinogenic mushrooms and that it's more of a sky blue. Um, it turns like a really interesting shade of violet when it dries. Wow. Um, but this, um, this specimen is now in the hands of Elsa Belinda. There's an undescribed Agarica species close to Agaricus Augustus. This uh, had, smells like anise and was very delicious. <laughs> and Hemidicutus marginata. This is a... This. It's Pyphoralis. It's kind of close to Tylopolis, but it has a brown, uh, brown pore surface. And Crystal Schwartz just identified that the other day. Um, this one is uh, a bully close to the by color. This one was really big. Um, the base was like maybe two or three inches thick. Um, yeah, it was a really cool looking one. Is it poisonous? I think it, it might be poisonous because the, uh, the pore surface stains blue. So, um, if the pore surface stains blue, you really got to look it up and identify the species before you cook it up. Do they not have poisonous amanitas there? Uh, yeah, there's, um, they got the amanita bisporigera down there, so that's the destroying angel. Um, they pretty much have poisonous amanitas all over the world. <laughs> so after Jalisco, we go to Colima, and Colima is a much more tropical area. Um, so Jalisco has a climate very similar to California, and Colima has a climate very similar to like, South America. And um, this is the Bader de Colima, which is uh, one of the world's largest active volcanoes. Uh, it's so active that the government makes people leave and they evacuate the villages because they think it's going to blow up soon. Um, in these tropical areas, the mushrooms don't occur out in the woods very often. You only have like, little tiny wood spored ones out in the woods. And they don't occur in the middle of this dry stream bed. But there's just a five foot um, radius right along the edge of this that continues for miles up the volcano, where there's lots of species diversity and lots of interesting mushrooms. 
This is a deep flexima. This is the first, uh, first time I've ever seen one of those. Uh, it looks kind of similar to lion's mane, but it has a texture like a polypore. And yeah, it looks really cool. And they have a bunch of little Bulbariella species down there. This is on our friend's yard. And this is Bolidis of the Ludibis. Um, very cool looking blue staining Bolide. And uh, probably poisonous, but what, we don't know for sure. What's, what's the tree? Or, or uh, these are oak trees that it's underneath. Um, they have really good oak species diversity there. Um, the oak here is the one that has the huge leaves. Um, it's really good for bullies and amanitas and agaricus and all sorts of stuff. This one looks like a amanita, but it's actually the Lepiota aspera group. So um, instead of having warts that you can take off, these um, these spots are actually part of the cap. And if you tear them off, uh, try to tear one off, they would just rip the cap open. This one is Fistulina Uh so a close relative to our beef steak mushroom. It, uh, this is another one that took us a couple of years to identify, um, but it's, it's, it has different shaped spores and different size spores than ours, and it's much brighter colored. This is Echinoderma asperum. Uh, when we found it, we thought it was an amanita, um, but it's actually saprotrophic and they saw us, so we found this in a sawmill. This is a species that's pretty rare out east, and it's the first time I've ever seen it. They have really cool polypores down there. Um, this is microborus. Pores are so small you cannot see them. And the honey mushrooms down there are tiny. Um, so they have Armillaria pulgarii. And it's really cool looking, pretty common. So after Colima, um, then we head over to Michoacan. And Michoacan is a great part of Mexico. Um, the people in Michoacan really like mushrooms, and it is so dangerous that most Mexicans are afraid to go there. Did you feel safe there? Yeah, I feel safe there. Um, I, I hang out with my friends, and um, they keep me away from the dangerous areas there. Um, like I said before, we've never had problems with people in Mexico. Uh, you know, we camp out at random spots every night and just wander around, you know, the woods all, all day. And uh, people, you know, don't even really give us dirty looks or anything. Um, they definitely don't try to take our things. So we've had uh, very good experiences with all these guys. This guy is a Matsutake hunter. And so we climbed this mountain and uh, um, all of the forest down below is his Matsutake hunting grounds. What's the altitude here? Oh, uh, this is about 1,500 meters. It's about 4,500 feet. In the time of year? Um, so mushroom season in Mexico starts in June and goes until October. Um, this, uh, we always visit Michoacan in August because there's a fungus bear. Um, what city? Uh, the fungus bear is in San Gu, which is not too far from Morelia. And um, it's a really great fungus bear. They've been doing it for 13 years. And we'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. Um, but they, yeah, if you want to go to Mexico to look for mushrooms, I would definitely recommend Michoacan in mid-August because the um, fungus bear is really cool to hang out at, at and um, people that are really friendly and they really like um, Americans coming there and you know, identifying their mushrooms for them. This one is Bolivia's Michoacanis. Um, <laughs> huge, it's about 10 inches across, um, probably poisonous, uh, stains blue pretty well, grows under oak. <laughs> Step away from the bowlies. <laughs> and uh, so the fungus bear is right across the street from the police station. <laughs> they don't really need these machine guns, it's, a, it's been pretty peaceful there, but um, they, they definitely carry around these huge guns everywhere, so it makes for great photo opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, usually they don't let you take their picture, but uh, <laughs> you got away with that one. Yeah, well we're friends with these guys. Uh, we, you know, we go here every year, and so they pay uh, Mexicans to go out into the woods and pick like every mushroom they see. And they bring up, bring back, just pick up trucks full of Mexican. And then, uh, and then uh, they bring them 
it all back to me, and then I soaked them for them. So um, we're really good friends with all the police and the president of the village and all of the politicians around there. Um, they're always really happy to see us and give us free places to stay and free food and wow. all this other stuff. Um, you get guns. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. Oh. Um, here are the police uh, looking through the microscope. Mm. And uh, the guy on the right is Carlos, and he's the guy who organizes the fungus fair. Um, so this year, the microscope was really popular with the kids there. Um, this is a this is the really? president of the village of you. And he's doing a television interview uh, about the fungus fair. They are very proud of the fungus fair there. Um, it's got, you know, we should have two or three hundred species of mushrooms. And then it's got about these 50 of these vendors, and they sell like uh, they sell shiitakes and mushroom stuff and food and all sorts of things. Wow. Oh my God. And uh, this is Sarah Yee holding Amanita polypyramus. Um, this is a very large Amanita from section of Lepidella. We find these every year. They're always this size. Uh, they smell a little bit like chlorine or kind of like a pool. Uh, no procar means uh, do not touch. And the first year I went to the fair, I didn't know that. And so I was picking up all the mushrooms and started dropping them. And Carlos came up to me and he's like, no tocar, no tocar. And I'm like, whoa, what is a tocar? <laughs> and um, he quickly realized that I was uh, not like all of the other people at the fair. And so he let me touch the mushrooms and photograph them all. And, um, and so, yeah, he's the guy that has us come and do all the identification for them. How's your Spanish? Um, uh, getting better every year. <laughs> but a lot of my friends down there speak English too, so it's, you know, we speak a lot of both. Um, so this is the queen of the fungus fair. Um, every year they have a queen. Um, we need a queen! Yeah. <laughs> it's a good. Crowd control. It seems like every event in Mexico has a queen. It's like yeah, they take some young girl from the community and dress her all up like a queen and they size all of them. I know it's their tradition. Um, but my microscope is extremely popular with all these kids. So um, if I was to zoom out, these, this, this line is usually about 15 or 20 kids long. And they all just like line up and look at all the scores and everything. And they, they really like it. Um, so this year we're going to bring a big screen and a camera so we can just uh, sit back and kind of project, they're awesome. having you know, a big, uh, you know, like, so everybody can see what's going on in the microscope at once and they don't have to line up. Can I ask you, what, what's in the background there, like all those, just because I do stores, I'm like looking at all the, like, yeah, so those are all of the vendor booths, and um, so they sell mostly mushroom related stuff, there's a lot of shiitake extracts, uh, a lot of reishi extracts, uh, like Ganoderma coffee. Um, but the booth to the right is the candy booth. Um, yeah. It's a really yeah. good candy booth. Okay. Uh, really good selection. And all of those Amanita muscarias up on the top are made of candy, so the kids uh, buy them and just like, oh, bite right into them. They you know, like, oh, this is kind of candy sugar paper. Mm -hmm. Do they, do they have a, a, a tradition of, of using mushrooms medicinally like the Chinese do? The rishis? And, I mean, I wonder, if, or is it imported? Well, I think um, they have more recently learned about the medicinal mushrooms there. Um, they've been using psychedelic mushrooms for thousands of years down in Mahaka. Um, but, uh, but recently the medicinal mushrooms like the Ganoderma and the Rishis have gotten cordyceps. real popular. Yeah, cordyceps. Um, it's pretty expensive down there, so you know, it's way cheaper to find your own and uh, make your own medicines out of them. They're, the medicinal mushrooms are very common in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Alan, you, you have to bring some candy mushrooms to the tea today. Yeah, yeah. Um, anything you want. Um, yeah. How many days is the fair? The fair is three days. So it's uh, like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday type thing. And, and it's in August? Yeah, and it's always in the middle of August. Um, so I'll call and find out the exact date. Oh. They have a really good lion's mane down there growing on the boat. <laughs> and this is Paniolus papilinaceus. So this is a Genophis dryophilus, which is a super common mushroom, um, but it's been infected by a parasite called Cisigospora mycetophila. Um, and it makes it look really wild. <laughs>
And uh, Mr. Khan also has some philosophies after the corn. This is corn smut. Wow, uh, corn smut is very popular in Mexico. Um, they usually use it to make quesadillas. Um, so like when they cook it up, it makes the quesadilla jet black. And it tastes pretty good. It's kind of like um, a very buttery taste. Um, so this is one of the Wheeler Kochi vendors. Um, she was selling um, quesadillas, of these things. And occasionally we'll drive by the cornfields and we'll see, you know, one year of corn is just massively enlarged and we'll stop and grab it. <laughs> <laughs> these are, this is the edibles table. Um, so all of the mushrooms that came into the fungus fire that we wanted to eat got moved over here. Um, so here there's a porcini on the left, and then we have a bunch of lactarius indigo. Um, so amanita rubescens, and uh, a bunch of lobster mushrooms. Um, Rumerias are also very popular to eat in Mexico. This is Omphalotus mexicanus. Uh, this is one that took us several years to identify, and I finally got frustrated, so I emailed Gaston Guzman, and I said, hey, do you know what this is? And he said, yep, that's a species that I described in the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is a Tylopolis boliviana. Uh, really good colors on this one. He's a pretty good eat. And this is the fungus fair from the year before, so this is the other queen um, of the fungus fair. And they have these cool, um, this is a Polybia incarnata. Uh, has these really cool kind of wavy gills on the bottom, bright red. And the sarcodonts down there are really cool. A lot of them are undescribed, but they have uh, very long spines. Wow. Much longer than anything we have around here. So like a hedgehog? Um, it's a little bit, looks like a hedgehog a little bit, but they taste bitter and it's not related. So hedgehog is in the hiddenum genus, and this is in the sarcodon genus. Um, so these are a lot tougher than hedgehogs. Hedgehogs are kind of fragile, it's kind of like chalk. And these things um, definitely take a beating. This is more Merasmus. This is not as close to Merasmus solobentiana. Um, there's really a lot of these. And Unfortunately, they all need microscopy to be able to identify them with certain different species. This one is Inosity corydalina. Um, this is a very rare species of Inosity that smells for all the world like Matsutake. Um, but you see on the left, it's kind of got this bluish greenish stain on the stem. So it probably contains psilocybin. Um, and it has very interesting cystidia. So over on the right, we have um, this really bulbous cystidia. And uh, this cystidia was just sticking up, and the depth of field, this magnification is extremely narrow. So what I did is I took seven pictures of this cystidia, all of slightly different uh, fine focus depths, and combined them with combined ZP to make one microgram that's all in focus. <laughs> they have shaggy manes. <laughs> and then, yeah, this one I just kind of cut it in half while it was sitting there. And this is uh, Agaricus Augustus. Uh, it's got a really nice almond scent. And so we took this down and took it to a restaurant and gave it to the chef and they cooked tacos out of it, out of the walls. It's really good. And this is Carlos with a table full of matsupaki. And they have this other hypomyces species. This is the yellow hypomyces, um, hypomyces luviobirans. Uh, also on Bex Brusilla. Not sure if you can eat this one, but it's pretty rare. I usually find it about once a year. And um, this one is cool. This, uh, this one used to be in tricholoma, but the spores were amyloid, so it got kicked out of tricholoma and put it into flocularia. So this is a flocularia luteobirans. And this is an extremely rare mushroom in Mexico. We only find it in one little part of one, one forest. But in that part of the one forest, it's extremely common. It just comes up all over this one pine plantation. Here we have, on the right, a Deconica species. And on the left, we have a lichen. It's a Peltigera species. Uh, Peltigera are very easy lichens to identify. It's one of the few that I can. They have, um, they're kind of like a liverwort type texture, but then in the bottom, they have these kind of um, like spikes that uh, root into the moss. This is a microheterotrophic plant, Capacodes monotropa. 
Um, so these are plants that do not have chlorophyll, and instead of chlorophyll, they feed on brucella mycelium. This one is a very rare species um, on the East Coast, also very rare in Mexico. Um, but again, in a certain part of the certain forest, we find it all the time. Bolotopsis lupa milana. Uh, it was my first time finding a Bolotopsis. We don't really have them in California. And this is that undescribed uh, snake horn again. Um, this was really big. It was like eight or nine inches tall. And it smelled awful. <laughs> the stem had the texture of styrofoam. Um, so we, uh, when we see these now, we collect them and we're gonna, you know, we save them, put them in the herbarium. Hopefully have a paper coming out in a couple of years giving us a name. This one is Cordyceps militaris. Um, it's growing out of a stick. And usually you don't see Cordyceps growing out of a stick, so there must be a bug in there. So after Mitchell Khan, we head over to District Federal. <coughs> and District Federal is part of Mexico, where Mexico City is. And um, Mexico City is a wonderful city with great food, but it's surrounded by volcanoes. And the volcanoes are covered in mushrooms. Yep, definitely a poisonous rattlesnake. Here we have Zoropholina pinuapis. And more children for bringing it again. And then at the very high elevations, you have Sulosophy Aztec Law. Um, this is one of the species that's named after the Aztec Indians, since they've been using this one for thousands of years. Um, usually, if you go there in like September, you'll see five or six of these. And if you go in October, you'll see over 9,000. Uh, are they pretty psychotropic? Um, I guess they do contain psilocybin. I've never eaten them. Um, but they stain blue just a little bit. And so I think they're probably weakly psychotropic. Um, but yeah, we definitely find uh, a lot of these, and only in extremely high elevations. So there's only two or three mountains in Mexico that are tall enough to have these. Um, and they grow in association with a certain bush of silvery leaves. And they have really cool rhizomorphs at the base of the stem. Um, so it's an, uh, such an aesthetic form, which means it has mango chase spores. So how high do they grow? They grow over 3,000 meters in elevation, so about 3,000 to 3,500 meters. This is an Inosity hystrix, and we have some uh, very long chylocystidia here, so we call it chylomacrocystidia. Um, this one was about 70 micrometers tall, which is some of the largest cystidia I've ever seen. And they have uh, pretty cool chanterelles down there. Uh, their chanterelles grow with pine. And this was uh, at about 3,300 meters elevation, so really high up. Uh, at this elevation, the only pine tree that can grow is Pinus hardwegii, which is a very, um, you know, very strong kind of a high elevation uh, pine tree that grows very slowly and uh, can take just about anything. And uh, these are chanterelle empanadas. <laughs> so we pretty much uh, cook mushrooms over a campfire just about every night. These turned out really good. Um, so after District Federal, we head east to Puebla. And Puebla is a really nice steak with lots of mountains and lots of rare mushrooms. Um, this is a Claudipus species. And Claudipus are really cool because they're in the Entolomitaceae. So you can see the spores over on the right. They are these angular spores, like all the rest of Entoloma. But Claudipus is unlike the other parts of Entoloma in that it grows like a shelf. So it's like the only shelf-like Entoloma. And uh, most of the Mexicans' Claudipus species are undescribed, but these are definitely something that we watch out for. This one is a Psilocybe mulircola. Um, this is a species that was described um, from this area in the 50s, but has not been seen since. Um, so we were able to get some really good pictures of it, and we have an upcoming scientific paper that I'm going to write with Gaston Guzman about expanded distribution. And um, when they described this species, they didn't do a very good job of microscopy, so now we've, uh, we've done a lot more microscopy on these, looking at a lot of different collections. 
and I'm going to revise the description and uh, update it. And this is more Salasa de Mulercula. So this curve is at very high elevation um, in ravines. And so you never find it out in the middle of the woods. It's only um, like in these dry street beds. This is an astomycete that we were never able to identify. And uh, more Salasa de Mulercula. Um, has an interesting ecological niche in that it grows right out of these kind of clay walls, uh, a habitat where you almost never see other mushrooms. So after that, we went over to Veracruz. Uh, Veracruz is on the East Coast. Veracruz is a very amazing place uh, for many reasons. Um, it's kind of tropical, but it has a lot of mountains, so uh, really good habitat for mushrooms. It has the highest mushroom and plant diversity of almost anywhere in the world. Um, there are so many things, like just about half the mushrooms that I saw in Veracruz I had never seen before. And uh, it has these like, crazy plants that look like mushrooms and smell like mushrooms and like emulate mushrooms. Uh, this is Pico de Orizaba, and this is the world's tallest volcano. It's right on the edge um, of Puebla and uh, Oaxaca and Veracruz. Also, Pico de Orizaba. This is a Lacrinea fusula. Uh, so this is a stick horn. It's the first time I ever found this one. Um, we found this way down by a river. We had to hike like a mile on this really steep hillside. Uh, but it was definitely worth it. Uh, it smelled pretty bad. <laughs> Not even I found it, so it's pretty much all flash. That's okay. Um, Rhodomyces is a genus that recently got split off from Mycena, and it's split off because it has a very viscid stem. And uh, this is a really tiny mushroom, it's growing on pine needles. Deconica horizontalis is the only Deconica species that grows uh, on a shelf like. Um, Growth habit and it grows on wood. And it uh, took us a long time to identify because most of these um, you know, shelf life things don't have purple brown spores. Uh, this definitely has purplish spores. This is a calistoma, probably calistoma lutescens. Uh, the calistomas are pretty common in Mexico, pretty cool looking. And Chrysopholina guaxula. It was described from the west coast of the United States, so I kind of doubt that's what we have here, but Christian Schwartz says that it's Chrysanthelina grossola, so I put that name on it. Um, lots of really interesting polypores here at Veracruz. This is a Styriopsis. Um, definitely my first time seeing a Styriopsis species. Um, so in Veracruz, you have a very interesting combination of east coast mushrooms and tropical mushrooms. Uh, you don't really have any of our West Coast species. You have, um, but you have all sorts of East Coast bullweeds, nemanitas, um, and then these uh, definitely came up in South America. This is a uh, Redo Bolivis label niger. Uh, it's a pretty good edible. This is Hidnellum ferruginum. Um, Hidnellum ferruginum has these really cool drops of red metabolites all over it. Uh, this is another one that's really rare, and we only found it in one little spot. Geronema strombordis is an east coast mushroom. <coughs> Grows on wood. <coughs> this is something we were never able to identify. Some people suggested hemimycena, but all of the known species of hemimycena are bright white. Um, so this was really tiny and extremely yellow. <coughs> No, this is on very well decayed wood. How, how large were these? Uh, these, the cap was, uh, largest cap was about eight millimeters across. And the small one, five, four millimeters. This is the destroying angel. So deadly poisonous. We confirmed that it was going to need a vice by putting KOH on the cap. The locals know this one pretty well. Definitely avoid it. Or and this this one is about a centimeter across. Um, so to take, oh no, put forward more. 
Okay, take a, to take a picture like this, I just uh, use the macro lens and set the manual focus to the very minimum. Then just move the camera until uh, it's in focus. This is one we were never able to identify. Some people suggested flying the line up, uh, but I don't think so. This one is Bolita's Curtisii. It's a good edible and it stains your hands bright yellow when you touch it. This one is pretty common, uh, like in Ohio and all over the East Coast. This one is Guipanopsis Helveloides. Um, pretty cool looking, very tiny little jelly. And this is one I've been looking for for a long time. Uh, Pentaloma Marea is the very pointy uh, Pentaloma, which is bright yellow. Uh, so it's always pretty cool looking. And it has cubic spores. Um, you can kind of see in the upper score. They look almost like little grains of salt. What's going on with the one on the right? Is it like a divided? It's like a tri... Yeah, we did a raining, thing? raining a whole lot up there, so um, when the mushrooms get old, sometimes they split open okay. due to the excessive moisture. Is this high altitude also? This is about 1,900 meters elevation. Um, so in Mexico, almost all of the really interesting mushrooms are high elevation. Um, down at the lower elevation, you find like Salasmi, Benzes, and Pinola cyanescens. We consider those mushrooms extremely boring, and we don't pick them. Um, instead, we go up into the mountains and uh, look for the really interesting species. Um, <coughs> it's uh, got much better species diversity up in the mountains, partially because the rain um, comes off the ocean and hits the mountains and drops all the rain right there. Um, also, the temperatures are much lower up there, so you get uh, really good diversity. Uh, you know, all sorts of different mushrooms that like different habitats. This one has really cute spores. You can see they look just like a grain of salt. Um, so this one is probably closely related to Entheloma marei, uh, probably undescribed. They have some really cool looking hygrosities there. Um, this was in a place called Bosque Vagus, which is one of the few beach forests in Mexico. So we searched there because beaches are very rare down there, and we're hoping for a good uh, species diversity, find some stuff that hasn't been seen before. Uh, this hygrosity is undescribed. Cool. Here's a different species of hygrosity. These were also on the side. And uh, Swillis is pretty common down there. This one's Swillis lutescens. Mexicans eat Swillis pretty often and they taste pretty good. This is Redibolitis flavo niger. Uh, really cooking, cool looking reticulation on this down here. And this is also very really this flower nature. Um, this happened to have a stick kind of growing up in the middle of it. <laughs> and this is Morganella incarnata, um, which is a really cool little red puffball that grows on wood. Um, this one is growing out of bromeliad. Um, this is another really rare one that we only see in this one mountain and have not seen anywhere else. Uh, this is Dictyopanis brasilis. Uh, the common name of this one is the pig pong back, and it's a little polypore, um, pretty cool looking. And Hydropus is a genus that is a uh, only tropical genus, uh, grows on wood, kind of Mycena-like, but the captain spares more. Uh, this is Psilocybe novo palapensis. Um, so down in Veracruz, they have this group of Psilocybe that we call the Psilocybe Fagicola complex. And macrosco macroscopically, they're all very similar. So whenever we find these, we have to use a microscope to identify them. Um, this is some of the most difficult mushroom identification I've ever done, because it's, uh, it's just really, uh, they're all very close, and there's a lot of undescribed species, lots of stuff going on there. Has anyone sequenced these? So uh, these are being sequenced by Laura Guzman at the University of Guadalajara. So all these mushrooms here are at the herbarium in Malapa. Uh, that way the uh, scientists can get them and see what's done. <coughs> this is Psilocybe hereray. Definitely the largest member of the Vagicola complex. Um, whenever we find this one, there's always only one of them. Psilocybe teotheoli is also in the Vagicola complex. 
Um, POPOI is recognized because it has two types of pyrosis in it. Salosophy Thicola has two types of chlorocystinia. Mycena elitifora, um, really cool looking mycena with uh, little hairs all over the stem and the crew now scalp. This one looks for all the world like a Coprinellus disseminatus, but the gills never turn brown. It's actually a mycena species. This is the true Coprinellus disseminatus. Some people think this one is a phyloporus, but there's no known species of phyloporus that have fuzzy gills. So um, I'm thinking it's probably something else. This one is Cyptotrauma aspirata. And the Lactaria syndico is pretty common down there. Um, we often use the blue paint that comes out of the gills um, to paint with that watercolor. Um, it's also good for making green eggs and ham. <laughs> Purple Fallon Gruber Sanctum is a lichen that was described from Florida. Um, we see it all over Veracruz. It's very colorful. This might be a Trimedia species, but we're not really sure. We're never, never able to identify this one with any certainty. So, after Veracruz, we headed south to Oaxaca. Um, by the time we got to Oaxaca, the mushroom season was almost over, um, but we didn't let that stop us. <laughs> so we thought this donkey looked pretty cool. Um, Oaxaca has beautiful markets. Uh, lots of tropical fruits down there. And um, these are the mountains of Oaxaca. Um, here, this is the edge of the road that we were driving on, and um, there was a massive landslide below this. It goes for hundreds of yards. It's actually really scary. Um, so if you take that turn too fast, uh, that's where you end up. Uh, this lady was selling schizophrenia in um, So this is one of the Mazatec Indians in Guadalupe de Jimenez. And uh, she offered to cook it for us, but we held to go, so we couldn't take her up on the offer. But they uh, sell schizophrenia in community all the time down there. It's one of the most popular mushrooms. And they use it to make soup. Apparently, it makes a very good broth. Yeah. And this is one of the mushrooms that is known to eat people as well. So um, if you have a weakened immune system, it can definitely bite back. <laughs> Maria Sabina is a uh, Mazatec Indian who introduced psilocybin mushrooms to the uh, Westerners in the 50s. Um, she was from Wabla de Jimenez, which is where we were here. And so in, uh, in Wabla, all of the taxis are Maria Sabina taxis. There's Maria Sabina this, Maria Sabina that. Um, she's pretty famous there. Uh, she's not always been super famous. Um, in the 60s, the townspeople got really mad at her and burned her house down. Oh. Here is one of the Maria Sabina taxis. <laughs> And here is Maria Sabina <laughs> eating her favorite little brown mushrooms. <laughs> this is um, a really interesting species of psilocybe. This is psilocybe cusinii. Um, this is one of the most picturesque species of psilocybe due to the extremely long um, papillate nipple on the top. Um, but all of the pictures of this species were black and white or very grainy. Um, it hasn't really been photographed in 50 years. So we went to a shaman, and the uh, shaman said, do you want to buy some mushrooms? And I said, well, only if they're fresh. And so she had to talk to some of her friends, but she ended up getting us um, five banana leaves uh, wrapped full of mushrooms, and they were fresh. And uh, we opened up the banana leaves, and we saw this uh, <laughs> in there. And we were like, wow, uh, we, we definitely are buying these. Um, <laughs> So we did the microscopy on this. This matches perfectly with Psilocybe Guzginii. And these, uh, these specimens are now in the herbaria at the Institute of Ecology in Palapa. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a painting on the wall of the room where we uh, <laughs> bought the mushrooms from the shaman. <laughs> <laughs> these shamans are all Mazatec Indians. They do not speak English or Spanish. 
Uh, I think the only word they know is mushroom. <laughs> Yeah, very, very popular down there. Um, Pedropus nigorita is a white sport mushroom that stains black. Um, this one's also one of the ones that was identified by Christian Schwartz. And they had really good mushroom art all over the town of Guadalajara. And so it was nighttime, I used the flash to photograph some of this mushroom art. And as I was doing that, the police came up to me and said, what are you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, what are you what are you talking about? I only speak English. Uh, I don't understand. And uh, of course I did understand, but uh, <laughs> they, they told me to empty my pockets. And uh, I'm like, okay. Well, I'm like, what, what is a pocket? And I was totally playing dumb. So they start emptying their pockets to show me what I should be doing. <laughs> so I start pulling stuff out of my pockets. I pull out a camera and some keys. And uh, after a while they got bored and let me go. <laughs> <laughs> Was that? Are mushrooms illegal for foreigners? Uh, yeah, the psilocybin mushrooms are illegal in uh, almost every country in the world, um, including Mexico. The indigenous people down there have been using them for thousands of years, so the police basically give them a pass and they're allowed to have them. Um, but people like me are definitely not allowed to have them. Huh. Um, also, Mexicans. Sorry, another question? Well, they just have ceremonies? Yeah, um, so they, they have these ceremonies, and they kept inviting us to these ceremonies, but we told them that, you know, we really just wanted the mushrooms for science. And I don't think they understood. Um, but, uh, yeah, they, they offer these ceremonies, and for about $10 or so, um, they will sing and chant all night while you eat the mushrooms and uh, have your shamanic eating. And this was in the next town over, um, San Augustine. And they have uh, this festival around this time of year uh, where they all, all these guys have these pointy hats. Uh, they're pretty scary, actually. Uh, you'll see like hundreds of people running through the street, all of them wearing these uh, very tall, thin, pointy hats. Uh, very popular down there. These, uh, this was a painting at a restaurant in Wendy. <laughs> and uh, here's some graffiti. This looks like an amnita muscaria with heart shaped warts and angel wings. <laughs> and they have all sorts of different like mushroom stuff all over the place. These are uh, lamps that are made out of wood. <laughs> and uh, Oaxaca has really beautiful sunsets with mushroom shaped clouds. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, this is my friend, Kepke, and I took this picture of him when he was sitting in the internet cafe, and then I loaded this picture into the GIMP and ran it through the neon edge pack filter. So it takes just a boring picture and <laughs> turns it into a really colorful picture. Wow. Um, so we had fun just like, taking pictures of like random stuff. Like, uh, this is Laura's medicine cabinet. <laughs> Laura is a witch, um, and she uses her, uh, she's uh, one of the black magic witches, and she uses black magic to cure people's ailments. Um, so these are black flower remedies, and they have the magical essence of various different flowers. So people come over, and she prescribes these drops to them, and they take them, and then they get better. That's in Oaxaca? Um, this is actually in Jalisco. Um, they're kind of skipping around here a little bit. Um, but yeah, in Mexico, they, they definitely believe in magic, way more so than they believe in magic in the United States. Um, it seems like half of my friends in Mexico are witches. How long was the trip? Uh, this, this last year I went down for three months, and uh, this year I'm going for four months. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this is Laura's cat. And they have a lot of these kind of parties in Mexico, it's a long exposure shot. Um, this is the Festival of the Virgin um, in Jalisco, and this is just like a massive party, it's really crazy. Um, so I got kind of bored, so what I would do is like walk up to people and start speaking English to them. And I'd be like, hey man, I got this pet elephant. I was wondering if you like have any like room like just want me a place to keep this pet elephant. And the Mexicans are just like freaking out, like, what the hell is this guy talking about? They have no idea. Um, and so I went up to a police officer and I said it to him, like, hey man, I, I just have this extra elephant. Do you know anyone that wants one? And uh, it turns out he lived in the United States for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> I knew exactly what I was saying. Um, 
And so the, he actually turned out to be really cool. And uh, so now I'm friends with him. And uh, every time I visit the city, I see him. And we hang out and talk about stuff. And um, elephants. <laughs> yeah, he didn't really say much about the elephants. He was astonished that I knew that he knew English. He was just really banking on the fact that he wouldn't. <laughs> Oh, wow. This is a DMF-real species. Um, this one was in Veracruz. This is what the locals call the 88 butterfly. Yeah. And um, it's all over Veracruz and Oaxaca. How Very important. This is about an inch and a half long. And um, to give you a sense of scale, it is sitting on a low block. <laughs> Oh. And they have these uh, really cool kind of wings that, uh, that have blue in the middle. So we were driving down the road in Oaxaca, kind of out by San Augustine, and we see an army truck uh, come up behind us, and we're like, oh, we'll let these guys pass. And so we let them pass, and then uh, once they pass, they stop, and they get out, and they all, uh, they all machine guns, and they all surround our car, and they're like, oh, we are checking your car now. Okay, yeah. you go right ahead. And so they only spend a couple minutes like digging through our stuff, and uh, then they let us go. And um, of course, we have mushrooms stacked at the ceiling. Um, that's generally not a problem because we have all different kinds of mushrooms. Um, you know, it's all scientific samples, all labeled observation numbers and everything. But then we went over. Um, after that, we were kind of uh, flustered from that, so we went down to the stream bank, and there was tons of butterflies down there. And uh, so we just kind of. Relaxed for a color breath and took pictures of butterflies for a few minutes uh, before we got back to mushroom hunting. Um, this is the entrance to the world's deepest cave. Um, no, not the world's deepest cave. This cave has the world's largest underground waterfall in it. Um, so this stream was massive, and uh, the waterfall is 2,000 feet tall. It's uh, completely subterranean. Uh, so this is the San Augustine Cave. Uh, this is one of the very famous caves that has been explored. So if you Google like San Augustine Cave, um, they got some really good pictures. A bunch of guys from National Ge Geographic went down there and uh, went for many, many miles. Mm. Uh, but we didn't even know this cave was here. We were just looking for mushrooms along this stream. <laughs> and we were in a very, uh, a very narrow valley. And all of a sudden, we, were, we look up and the valley just ends. Uh, but the valley is carved by rivers, so how could a valley just end? Well, we had to find out. So we went to the very end of the river and found this massive hole. Um, wow. The feeling of sitting on the edge of this is pretty undescribable. Like the water is going down this, you know, many, many gallons a second, falling down hundreds of feet into this abyss. Wow. And when we got back, we talked to the townspeople, and they said, yeah, this cave is very famous. And, uh, you know, lots of uh, very experienced cavers uh, come to this place to explore it. Mm. These are great silos. And uh, this is uh, called for a day Perotti, which is a mountain in Veracruz. Um, so the mountain is really tall and has a lot of edibles, lots of honeys and bullies up in the mountain. But down below, where these clouds are, is the place that has the most psilocybe species diversity of anywhere in the world. They have 30 or 40 species described from this area down here. And uh, the reason is these clouds are here every day. Um, this is one of the mountains around Mexico City. And uh, this is Nevada de Toluca, uh, another mountain around Mexico City. So we were trying to find the highest elevation mushroom we possibly could. So this is uh, about 4,300 meters elevation here. Um, and this is, so this is way above the tree line. Um, we unfortunately were not able to find any mushrooms here, but we went down about 500 meters and found the very, you know, very, very, very top pine star wedgie tree that was signified the very start of the tree line. We found some little carrier right there. This is by rain from Mushroom Observer, and uh, the, the queens of the fungus fair in the show down this year. By rain was very popular with the ladies down there. <laughs> and this is Sarah E fixing a microwave. Um, this microwave was struck by lightning and fried the computer. Um, so what Sarah E did is uh, went to the hardware store and got that light switch there and replaced the computer of the microwave with a light switch, which she installed um, in the little place where the display used to be. And uh, the microwave worked after that. Uh, so yeah. yeah, it's not cool having a microwave with a switch on it. So. 
Uh, Sarah Dee likes to teach the local people about mushrooms. So this is a mushroom dehydrator. Um, in Mexico, it's very humid a lot of the time. So the mushrooms don't dehydrate very well. And even if you do dehydrate them, they uh, reabsorb water and start rotting right, uh, right away. So this thing has a fan in the top and a heating element in the bottom. So it drives all of the, uh, all the moisture out of there. And then put them in uh, that, or like a Ziploc bag so the moisture does not get reabsorbed. And this is an extremely oh. sketchy bridge. <laughs> yeah. This is a bridge um, over the um, Punta de Fierro, which is in Oaxaca. And, um, you know, if this was in the United States, they would have destroyed the bridge or put like a really, really big fence up so nobody could cross it. Yeah. Um, but this is Mexico, so they put about 50 cents of barbed wire on the end. Oh, uh, so <coughs> we uh, cross it. And uh, it's actually in pretty good shape, except for this one spot where there's <laughs> really any bridge, and they put this log across. Of course, this log is very round, so when you try to walk out, it rolls all over the place. It makes it really any to go across. Uh, this is a pizza with lactarius indigo, and lactarius species, and some peanuts. That turned out really well. And uh, here we have homemade enchiladas. Uh, these were shiitake enchiladas. They were really good. And uh, this looks like iced tea, but it's actually uh, shiitake water. So we use the, the water that we rehydrate the shiitakes in. Uh, we then add some sugar to it and make a cold beverage out of it. And this is a... Um, Chant fried chanterelles, <coughs> chanterelles and empanadas, um, some really delicious homemade orange sauce, and avocados, and torchada. <laughs> and uh, in the United States, we basically uh, cook our mushrooms very differently than they cooked them in Mexico. Um, so in the United States, we like fry them at pretty high temperature until they're kind of brown. Um, in Mexico, they just like toss them in boiling water and make soups out of them usually. Um, so it's, it's kind of good. It's, it's a different style. It's, uh, you know, a lot of the mushroom, the flavor from the mushrooms comes out of the soup. Um, they definitely like it when I come down there and cook them, uh, you know, United States style. Something different for them. Um, but this is Romarian soup, and it's quite good. And fresh sweets lemonade and homemade raspberry jam. And these are trout. <laughs> fried them over the camp line. And uh, here we are making salsa. So we like fry these things at really high temperature for a couple minutes and then uh, mash it up into a salsa. And that's all I got. Yeah. <laughs>